uh, the one good thing that Paul consistently identifies in the churches that he writes to, where there are often pretty awful things going on, is that they are living consistently in the grace of God. That is, that every day, day by day, with their weaknesses and their failures and their inabilities, they come again to the Lord Jesus and they rest everything on him. They rest everything on him. It's what faith amounts to, isn't it? We've got this idea of what faith is. We define it intellectually in all these terms. But in practical terms, the way we live our lives day by day, we rest them on him. We look to him for it. <clears throat> Did I say to you last week John Piper had actually put something on his Twitter feed or I don't know, somewhere clever uh, last, last week um, around this whole issue of faith? You know, asking the question, what are we doing as churches that will fall flat on its face if God didn't show up? Because the things that will fall flat on their face, perhaps if he doesn't show up, are the things that we know in faith. And the other things, maybe not so much. Well, here's Paul writing to these churches that are consistently leaning their all on the grace of God. We, don't do, we can't do this. We depend on you and your mercy and your grace, the unmerited favour of our God towards us. If this is going to happen, this is going to work. Now, <clears throat> Of course, Jesus is one of those people who you meet and are changed by meeting him. Somebody was speaking this week on Radio 4 as I was driving around the countryside about having had an award presented to them by Nelson Mandela. And they say Mandela is a man who you meet and you're changed by him. But they don't speak so much about is how he came to faith in Christ and how he leads everything on Christ. You meet Jesus and you're changed by meeting Jesus. And of course, the Holy Spirit of God lives within the consciousness of anyone who's been truly turned from sin to follow Jesus, and that Holy Spirit there, he contends against the indwelling sin that is still a part of every genuine believer in Jesus. Every person is genuinely entrusting their life into his hands, moment by moment, day after day. And what he, the Holy Spirit, is doing in such people is changing us at the deepest level from the inside out. Of course, that is the case. Of course, our, our God profoundly satisfies his people, either by granting our desires or by changing them. Of course that's what he does, but he's in us doing those things. And what Paul finds to commend in God's people, even when they're getting something terribly wrong in their lives, in the life of the church, the way the church at Colossae was getting things wrong, this church that met in Philemon's house, what they're getting right is that they are living, depending not on any good, clever, or beautiful thing in themselves, but on everything that is good and great and glorious about God and his grace. That's what's good about them. And you see Paul picking that up in the first verse uh, here in this, in this, in, in this book. You, you see that in the verse we begin with today from 1 Corinthians. You see it in the way Paul starts off this epistle to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia our sister, to Archippus our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the thing that you can latch on to. That's what's good about this bunch of people. It's a great church. Is it why? Because it's got this music scene going on. It's fantastic. It's a great church. Why? Because it's got this student work going on. It's brilliant. It's, lovely. it's fantastic. Student work going on. It's great. Um, it's a brilliant church. You know? why, why is that? The ministry is fantastic. I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting these things you can go and say about here, but, but I'm saying this happened. The ministry is just fantastic, you know, is it? The people are utterly helpless but for Christ on whom they depend. That's a great church. And what Paul picks up to say is good about the churches that he deals with, consistently where he's doing that, is he's saying they lean on Jesus. They're really leaning on Jesus and it's grace. They make much of the grace of God. Their thoughts, their attitudes, their responses are conditioned by the fact that the Son of God has loved me given himself for me. That's all I got. That's all I got. And you see that coming out, not just in the way he finds things to be grateful for about churches, say that that's good about churches. You see it coming out the way Paul has been seeking to motivate Christian conduct. The way he's been trying to motivate Philemon. The way he handles Philemon and deals with the returning runaway slave in Essenus. Our salvation from sin depends on the grace of God in at least two dimensions. His grace frees me from the penalty of my sin 
It motivates me to liberate my life from that sin. So as Paul writes to Titus, Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live upright, godly lives in the present evil age. What makes you do that? Not the law. But the grace of God that brings salvation, which has appeared to men. Paul's making much of grace, yet yeah? as, as our, our means of salvation, but as our means of being motivated to live for God. And he's doing that with Philemon right through this letter. You know, we've saying this, we've been saying this letter opens a window. A letter from one block to another asking him to be nice to a runaway slave. Right? It's not that. It's opening windows for us on the way things happen and are done. How does a how does a person in pastoral responsibility, which Paul is for Philemon, how does a person actually motivate? How does a person actually go to somebody and say, you need to do this, bro? How does he do that? Here's an example with Paul. He makes so much of the grace of God because it's the grace of God that makes us want to get out of bed in the morning and follow Jesus. Undeserved, unknown favour of God instead of what we did deserve. In Paul's theology, grace is the driver of godliness to which he appeals for, for the regulation and the reformation of human conduct. And if you thus motivated, put to death the desires of your sinful nature, you will live. <coughs> Paul says that in Romans 8.13. That's how he's been dealing with Philemon so far in this book. God's grace is a far more powerful motivator, it actually works, in fact. Far more powerful motivator than his law. And Paul has shown, Paul has established in the early verses, that God's grace is strong in Philemon. As Philemon's conduct, which Paul has noted, clearly attests the way he is to the church. His hospitality, his love, his care for the people of God. Mirroring, reflecting back the grace that he's received from God into the life of his local church. Building that community of people that speaks to those that are outside it. Of the relationships that are brought into being by grace. They see how grace works out as a principle in the community, in the, in the shared life of the people of God. Okay, well as a result of that, there are four things going in, on in these verses of ours here today. So even 21 to 25. Verse 21. Verse 21 expresses Paul's confidence in Philemon because of the grace of God that's at work in Philemon. Verse 22, Paul looks forward to being released and travelling up to see Philemon, so he wants to enjoy the gift of refreshment that God's grace has put in Philemon. Prepare a room for me. Verses 23 and 24, Paul's team comes out of the woodwork. These people who are saved by grace to be heralds of grace. I'm going to look at them in a minute, briefly. And then verse 25, that meaningful closing farewell. What is it that Paul finishes up, runs off the book with? Exactly what he started the book with, exactly what he's been dealing with in its effects and consequences throughout the book. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It's all about grace this book. It's about pastoring people in the grace of God. Modifying and motiv motivating Christian conduct. Based on grace, driven by grace, manifested. Just thought about that. Just thought about that. Okay, so the evidence then, the evidence of God's behaviour modifying grace <coughs> builds uh, confidence in the people of God. That's the first thing. Why didn't it do that? It has now. The evidence of God's behaviour modifying grace seen in somebody builds confidence in that person. This person of grace. Now you can work that out in all sorts of ways. That makes you a rock. They're not dependent on anything you are or can do or will do. Right? They're depending on, on the God who can. It makes you a rock. And frankly, dealing with guys around me, you know I deal with some pretty hard cases, don't I? You know, I, you know what I, I, I get the opportunity and the privilege to deal with some very interesting people. Right? They are looking for men who can be rocks into whose shadow they come. They can come into the shadow of a rock. They're looking for rocks or guys out. They're really, really not looking for what they so often think they see in the Church of God. They're looking for guys who are rocks because they're founded on the rock. You can be confident in a guy like that. And Paul's going to have confidence in a guy like that because he's going to be looking at God for everything. And that's going to be okay. When people become independent and self-sufficient and think there's something about themselves, they're not guys you can rely on because they're not looking in the right place for the strength they're going to 
course, I'm confident about you, Philemon. I'm confident about you. You can have confidence in the community of God's people when we all live consciously dependent on his grace, not what we can achieve. Is that making sense in English? Have I flogged this horse to death? Flog it again. It's an important one. It destroys confidence when believers are living with guilt, not with grace. It destroys confidence. The way people behave towards one another is poor when they're overburdened with guilt. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who are called according to his purpose. You can be confident in a person who's not living with guilt anymore because it's pinned on the cross with Jesus. You can't be confident in the responses of what you're going to get from people who are living with a lot of guilt on them all the time. Grace builds confidence in people. Guilt destroys our responses to one another. Guilt hampers our decision making. It wrong foots our choices, our priorities. It wrong foots our prayers. You can have confidence in the people of grace. And they can afford, they are the people who can afford to be calm and at peace because they're relying on God and He's reliable. They can afford to be merciful and accepting and forgiving because they know we only get by on the mercies of God day by day. We can afford to be forgiving and accepting because but for the grace of God, what will I be doing? They're changed people because love, because mercy changes people hearts. Something that crime and law and punishment alone can never do. You can't change people like that. You can be confident in fellowship with the people of grace. I'm confident, says Paul, that reflection on the reality of God's grace in your life and the reality of the change that grace creates in you, that you're now going to respond to my appeals to you on the basis of grace, Philemon, to be gracious in receiving back this brother who previously has wronged you. How much trouble is caused in churches for guys? For women? Because we're not receiving back those who wronged us. What's the gospel about? You'll see that comes up in the team in a minute. That is an important principle. Receiving back people who've wronged you. You can be confident in fellowship with such people. And I am confident, says Paul. The reality of God's grace in your life, thinking that through, the reality of the change that God creates in you, come on, the lesson is receiving back in a way that glorifies and makes famous in your area, in all your acquaintances, the glories and the grace of our God. Show your grace in dealing with Him, and people will see grace. Confident you're going to do this. And, and here's the second thing to notice about this verse here. Since I'm confident in your obedience, I'm writing to you, knowing that you'll do even more than I say. That's what grace does. This is very, very basic Christian discipleship stuff. It's the first lesson. Grace doesn't just travel one mile. Grace doesn't just travel one mile. What do you mean by that? Here's what Jesus says in his basic formulation of what constitutes the character, the personality, the way we do things amongst the community of people who've been saved by grace. Where does he write that down for us? He writes that down for us in Matthew 5 through 7. He writes that down in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. And here's what he says about it. Here's what it means to live by grace through faith alone. <coughs> You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yep, Moses said that, it's in the law, it's the absolute, it's the highest level of biblical revelation, says his audience as he cites this verse. But I tell you, oh, Jesus has taken to himself the authority to speak as God. Moses is coming as the lawgiver, Jesus is coming as the giver of the new covenant. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. How does that sound? Jesus is hanging on the cross. What's he doing? Is he resisting an evil person? He's not resisting an evil person. As the lamb was led to the slaughter, so comes Jesus. Here's an important aspect of what it means to live by grace through faith alone. Here's what it means to live by grace through faith alone. To live changed by the overwhelming grace of God. The grace of God went to the undeserved uttermost so that we could be set free for glory. <coughs> 
If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. That's what it means not to resist an evil person. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, so again that, go with them another mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. We heard what we were said in the old covenant, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but we've got this covenant in grace, and I tell you, with that covenant, don't resist an evil person. Do not resist an evil person. And then he applies that basic fundamental principle. In the case of absolute personal affront, in this case a slap in the face, he applies that in the case of a legal challenge, sued for the shirt off your back. He applies that in the case of the Roman soldier, the legionary, on the, on the long march, who exercises the oppressive Roman legal right to compel one of the subject peoples of the empire to carry his backpack for him for one mile to give him a rest on his long march. Don't do that. Do two. God's lavish grace affects you that way. It's changed us by not giving us what we deserve, but paying the price, bearing the cost, so that he takes what we deserve, we get what he deserves. What the eminent theologian Mona D. Hooker, that's her name, I kid you not, Mona D. Hooker, she calls interchanging. We have been overabundantly blessed when we deserve to be abundantly condemned. How does that change a man? That's just bound to affect you. So where, where, where's living in God's grace going to take us then? Come on, Philemon, come on. This Onesimus has come back. Where's this grace going to take you? I'm confident of your obedience. I'm writing to you knowing you will be even more than I said when I said. He's wronged you. He's offended you. He's taken you back as a brother. Even more than I say, you can imagine, Paul hasn't specified what he wants. <laughs> so all the commentaries go through lots of ink. Right? About what it is that Paul actually wants. Well, he, wants he wants grace to be shown. He's not going to specify. It's grace. And you're showing grace back. If he specifies, it's not grace coming back, is it? It's what comes out of the overflowing abundance of your heart. Out of gratitude to God. For what he's done. See, I said right back at the beginning, this book is not about the manumission, the setting free of slaves, and the abolition of slavery. Paul isn't asking for the setting free of a slave. He's asking for so much more. He's saying, take this guy as your brother. Because that's what God's made him. By grace is your brother. Paul doesn't make an issue of Paul Philemon returning Onesimus to Paul, to be Paul's helper in the mission centred around Paul's prison cell in Rome. He drops a pretty big hint in verse 13, I'd like to keep him with me so he can take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. That would be nice. <laughs> but I didn't want to do anything without consent, so I'm sending it back. Who knows God knows what I'm going to do. He points to the general principle. He leaves Philemon to work out what it means confident that enjoying the luxury of God's graces has so changed, it's been such a life changer for Philemon that Philemon is surely going to go more than a mile here and again, it's a window opened on the way this church and this people are shot through with grace and the reality of the work of grace in these guys, it builds confidence in Paul about Philemon, confidence secondly, that was the longest point, it's okay Safe in my hands, in your own. Uh, expectation, verse 22. Paul's got confidence in this guy because of the grace of God in him. But Paul is so overcome with, with uh, grace himself, he has expectation of his God. His God is a gracious God. What do we expect from our God? One more thing, prepare a guest room for me. Because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Where is he? He is in Nero's jail, chained up. Said that earlier for us, isn't he? I'm in chains. He became my son while I was in chains. Paul is not inhibited in sharing his faith, in bursting with the grace of God at people. 
just because he's chained to, to a soldier on a wall or something. The very guest room for me. You've been praying for me. You love me because of the way grace has been active in your life. So you've been praying. So I expect to be released. And I expect to come and see you soon. Because I've just got a heart for Ephesus, that place over in Asia. And I've got a heart for that Lycus Valley. And I've got a heart for all the trading connections where the gospel has been going forward as a result of the work I've been able to do there. I'm coming back. Here we ready. Make a bed. Make a bed. Perhaps instead of the word expectation, I should have chosen the word expectancy. Paul is stuck languishing in jail in Rome, the prisoner of a godless, twisted, violent emperor. Is he? He is not. He is the prisoner of Christ Jesus, he says early on, on whose authority Paul finds himself in jail. He is patently running a mission to Rome from his cell, leading multiple missioners. He's going to say who they are in a minute. Conscious that many people are praying for him, he anticipates greater usefulness to come as he lives expectantly, hoping for return to Asia, to the Lycus Valley area, part of what he's doing down in Ephesus, to carry the work of God forward. And, and a good man I know, leading lots of student work in our land, he gets teased for the way he posts, you know, overtly optimistic tweets about what's happening through, uh, through student missions, and, and, and he's constantly <coughs> using this hashtag, hashtag expectant. One of his senior female workers picked it up recently. The people was nearly choked seeing a single Christian girl putting expected on the hashtag. Because <laughs> that's with me. Um, but, but, you know, I've had a word with him about it. I don't know if he's got the point. Um, <laughs> you can't just go and say, that. Seriously. Paul is brimming with expectancy. And it's born of his living close to theological reality. He's not Nero's prisoner. He is Christ's bondservant. He is not removed from the Great Commission. He's called to it whatever insalubrious location he finds himself in. Even Albie's in the queue. Or stuck in a Roman jail. He is not stuck where he is. Lost to the ministry. Washed up. Finished. Grace teaches you this. It teaches you that God, your God takes and rescues the hopeless. That everything is dependent on nothing but his grace. That actually, yes, it is useless. It is hopeless, unless he shows up. But when it was hopeless, and when it was useless, he has shown up. Grace. Cross. Salvation. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. One more thing, <clears throat> that is, at the same time as this grace you're going to proclaim to the watching world and the way you treat our lessons, and at the same time as that, make the bed, says Paul, there's a God, he's gracious, you've been praying, so I'm coming. You can reckon it'll need to be more than one bed. And Paul has slipped back here from the singular that he was using for the bulk of the letter into the plural. You guys make beds. <laughs> We're coming! The boys are coming back. For you. For your benefit, says the Greek. But it's going to be more than Philemon who need to make the bed. Because Paul is coming with his team again to bless them. All things going on here. Confidence, verse 21. Expectation, verse 22. Teamwork, verses 23-4. Does it occur to you the manifestation of the grace of God in this world is teamwork? The Father is determined and planning. The Son has paid the price on the cross. The Spirit of God applies all that they've done to the hearts of the individual. Now, if God does this by teamwork, what does grace teach us to do? There's theology all through the way Paul does stuff, isn't there, really? Yeah? The last two verses of this letter, Paul ostensibly sends greetings from his team, from his co-workers, which is what he calls them, 
So Philemon, his co-worker, which is what he calls him at the beginning, in verse 3, is it? I can't remember. And the church that meets in his house. What are we relearning? As Paul opens up this window for us on the workings of the Pauline mission, and the things that are obvious to those members of the early church that we've forgotten perhaps along the way somewhere. It is the emphasis on apostolic teams and shared ministry that now reemerges at the end. What are the emphasis point? Because you emphasize things at the end. Push. Team ministry. Of course, Paul has modeled for the church and its leaders the way to urge pastor, counsel, the elders who may be in error in Colossae. Of course, he's been showing how not to rebuke an elder harshly through his public handling of this guy, Philemon. Safe to handle this way because he's not apparently succumbed to the serious Colossian error. He's really living in the grace of God. But he's demonstrating clearly the example here at this point of emphasis of teamwork. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Question. How many fellows has he got on his team? How many fellows has Paul actually got with him? At least five mentioned here, and then Onesimus, who he longs to have back on the team with him, has been on the team with the big sense. See, we tend to think it's big churches that need team ministry, don't we? <laughs> Here's a snag. It's possible in the early churches Paul planted, it was the other way around. When churches were being planted, they had big teams. And then they had sort of a bunch of lay elders. A preacher teaching. Pastor teaching. Possible. Looks kind of that way. Yet again, we may have this upside down. <laughs> well, that's as maybe. But certainly, it was shared ministry and apostolic teams and the bishop of the Gentiles sent out from Antioch. And we know it was kind of that way in the church in Jerusalem too because there was loads of them there standing on one of the toes. Paul's pioneering was always by teamwork. Is that correct? Paul always pioneered by teamwork, is that correct? Can you think of an example where he didn't? Are you asleep yet? I've rocked you well. <laughs> you know. Well, there is an example where he didn't, where things had gone really wrong in Derby and Lister and the places he was in before. And, and uh, he ended up, in Thessalonica, he ended up in Athens, having to leave situations that were hot spots to get away. And he ended up in Athens, and he was so moved by the mess of the city, by the spiritual chaos of Athens, that he kicked off without his team. He never tried to do that again. Interestingly enough. Paul usually spells out the people with him as he closes his letters, but the, the closest parallel to this passage is, is Colossians 4, 10 to 15, because the two letters are going together, aren't they? Paphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, also mentioned. But in the light of the similarity, the, the differences are worth noting. Paul signs the end of the Colossian letter. Doesn't do that here, but of course he's done that a little way in the, body, the main body of the epistles. So don't, don't worry about that. In the Colossian letter, Tychicus is, is mentioned as the letter carrier. Here in Philemon, he isn't mentioned as the letter carrier. I don't know whether he stayed in Colossae, you know, away somewhere, or whatever, or whether perhaps the letter to Colossians was delivered first because he substantial important letter and, and they now know that Tychicus is coming with the authority of Paul with his letter and so they're going to have to have that mentioned again it's quite conceivable that might be the case this would be read after the more important doctrinal letter to Colossians don't know in Colossians the name list is divided between Jews and Gentiles no such division made here in Philemon um, the unity of God's people isn't the issue here not really the way it is in Colossae but uh, not in Philemon the ethnic background of Philemon is probably a Gentile anyway, so he doesn't, he doesn't need it all sort of spelled out when they're all together. You know, sort of so who we got? We've got Mark. Who's Mark? This is important. Mark is identified as, for us in Colossians 4 as the cousin of Barnabas. Is this ringing bells? Paul's first missionary journey, do you remember that? Paul and Barnabas set off together, and Barnabas being the sort of inclusive guy he is, he wants to bring John Mark along. And uh, John Mark gets wet feet and fearfully turns back and has a big bust up with Paul. Here's John Mark. Back reconciled and on the team. 
Philemon, receive an SOS by the grace of God. He's coming back repenting. The grace of God is sufficient. Here's John Mark and Paul's team. The grace of God is sufficient. He's let me down. He's back on the team. And in a letter that emphasises the effects of grace in producing reconciliation and appeals for reconciliation for an SOS, that's going to be rather significant. John Mark. Here he is. Aristarchus. <laughs> Strange name. He's amongst Paul's travelling companions way back there in Acts 19 and 20. Originally a Macedonian, he was with Paul in the riot at Ephesus, uh, Acts 19, 21 to 41. In Colossians, he's identified as Paul's fellow prisoner, Colossians 4, 10. He, like Epaphras, Aristarchus, like Epaphras, battle-scarred veteran on the team. Do you know, <laughs> there may be bigger churches where they've got this. The cause of God needs its battle-scarred centurions. Guys like this. Guys like this. Demas and Luke, they sound very much like Gentiles. We know Luke is an intellectual, a physician, that's identified for us elsewhere in Scripture. He's the one at the heart of the, the we passages of Acts, you know, we did this, we did that. Acts 16, 10 to 17, Acts 25 to 15, Acts 21, 1 to 18, Acts 27, 1 to 28, 16. Identified Colossians 4, 14 as the beloved physician. He's the intellectual guy. We know he's intellectual. You read those first five verses of Luke's Gospel. He can churn out some pretty classy Greek. Quite an intellectual guy, but look, he's born. The heat of the battle and the burden of the day. So that's the way guy, solid bloke. And then there's Demas. Demas, 2 Timothy 4, 10 to 11. Even Demas has deserted me. <coughs> All sorts on that team. Co-workers, says Paul. Co-workers in the cause of their God. A testimony to the inclusiveness of God's grace. In terms of their ethnic composition, in terms of their experience level. In terms of what they've got in them. No more hierarchical boundaries. This, this grace of God, these experienced and more recent partners, Paul is emphasising again the, the breakdown of societal and hierarchical boundaries in the light of the Gospel of Christ. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And every one of us is both utterly and only significant because the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. <coughs> that's what I've got going for me. <coughs> and that's true of us, whether our name is Onesimus or Philemon. Receive him back as a brother. So, finally, this meaningful closing farewell of verse 20. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Four things going on in these verses. Verse 21 expresses Paul's confidence in Philemon because the grace of God is powerfully at work in him. It's right at the front of his mind. Verse 22, Paul, Paul looks forward to being released and travelling up the sea, sea Philemon, which seems completely impossible because he's got a grace, grace and he does gracious things in response to his people's prayer. Verses 23 and 24, Paul's team comes out of the woodwork and the composition of that team speaks to you about the grace of God and how it works out in the fellowship that he creates. Verse 25, this meaningful closing farewell. So, given the challenge then to our sinful human flesh that this gospel of grace poses, here comes what Philemon both has and now needs. Day by day by day. The whole point surely has been that the grace of God has been very evident in Philemon's life. And Paul has, Paul has gone to some lengths to identify the symptoms of God's grace, if you like, that have been very evident in Philemon. <coughs> but the challenge to ongoing Christian conduct is dependent on working that grace through his attitudes, through his responses, like the letters running through the stick of rock. It's got to run right through. And Philemon is dependent on the grace of God to meet this challenge. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the biggest spirit. The church is going to be okay if the grace of God is with us. If the grace of God is our controlling awareness, our most significant issue. 
in the words of Dallas Willard, the balance looks like this, and this is why Paul has sought to persuade Philemon and to motivate him the way that Paul has, rather than the command and the law. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is the powerful motivation of the sacrifice that's required to follow Christ. Now, obviously, Paul used the plural in his prayer. He prays not simply for Philemon, but for the church that meets in Philemon's home, for the church in Colossae, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because then the community that is, that is the apologetic for this gospel will be built to function day after day. That's the way God's people are motivated and drawn to discipleship, the radical, fundamental transformation of human life and the service of the kingdom of God actually come about because of the grace of God and meditation on it living with it, relying on it. Here's what drives the function of the community of the people of God, whose context provides the fundamental apologetic for the gospel of God. It's not about proving the resurrection. Do that, but it's not about that. It's about seeing God's grace at work in a body of people, a community of people of God, in the way we deal with each other. Reflecting that grace into the world. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ then be with our spirit, because then there's hope. Then there's life in the people of God. Then there's hope for the gospel of God, because it looks like something people want. <coughs> Four things going on here. Paul expresses confidence in Philemon because of the man relying on God's grace. Paul looks forward to being released, travelling up to see Philemon by God's grace. Verses 23 to 24, Paul's team comes out of the woodwork, which itself is a manifestation of the grace of God that those guys should ever be together doing what they're doing. And then there is meaningful closing farewell. <coughs> so where have we come to with this epistle? We've come back to the importance of recognising and realising day by day the futility of our own efforts, gifts and abilities. We've come back to a fresh realisation that Paul wants to put before that church. They've already got it. He's reminding them of useful things. Remind us to stimulate them to, to useful thinking as Peter writes elsewhere. He, he, he wants them to be conscious that, that their lives are going to be built on this grace and motivated by it. Because too frequently in churches, it's very, very easy to be telling people what they ought to be doing. And Paul is deliberately in this letter with, with Philemon and Esmus. It's not that Paul doesn't know what needs to be done. It's not that Philemon doesn't know, know what needs to be done. He's saying, look, the grace of God, where does it lead us? What does it teach us? What does it motivate us to be doing? And why is that important? Because we need to be active, as verse 6 says, in the sharing of our That we might have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ, but that our sharing this, this faith in God's grace together might actually represent that to the outside world as well. It is the community of the people of God that models, that demonstrates, that speaks with and without words of what folk need, because they know that that's appealing, and what they need to be saying. There's the, there's the conflict. A man stands on a street corner and he stands on a box and he shouts at people that they need to repent or perish. Is he faithfully proclaiming the gospel? church that came because it's in that context that the gospel needs to be shown, seen and represented verbally and in fellowship. I pray, says Paul in verse 6 that you may be active in the sharing of your faith that you, plural, might have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ and that others might see that too in that context glorifies God, builds confidence in the gospel and helps people to 
Christ who is proclaimed. Amen.